We have the pleasure of having Professor Arjidas Pushis. Did I get that right? Yes. And uh, from Vilnius, Lithuania, and he will be followed by Professor Thomas Linkevicius, also from Lithuania, and they will talk about <coughs> prosthetic and surgical components <coughs> to achieve predictable results with your medicine. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you, organizers, for inviting me here. It's a huge honor to be on the stage. And my name is Algirdas Pushis. I came from Vilnius, capital of Lithuania, where I work and do research in my private practice. It's an 11-year clinic with a training center, and my specialty is dental implantology. I started in 2003, and since that, I have 15,000 implants placed in my career. Of course, I have a wonderful team, and one of the most important colleagues is Thomas, Thomas Linkiewicz. Thanks to him, I was able to publish and be author and co-author of uh, more than 20 publications. And of course, it's a huge honor for me to be as a contributor of his new Zero Bonus concept book, of surgical part. Today, my topic is immediate implant placement in aesthetic area. And you know what, dear colleagues? I really, it was a very difficult task for me for many, many years to achieve the best result. And then I, I go back to 2006, to a year when I already learned a little bit to augment soft tissues, to do some bone grafting. I ended like this, with recession, with bad contour, color, etc., etc. And you know, yesterday we had a dinner with Miguel Stanley, and he told me a very, very true story. So you know, sometimes when we learn, we do something, and we work in small clinic, and get results like this, we feel very lonely and very disappointed. And I was also very frustrated at that time because I wanted to achieve very good, very beautiful result, and I felt like a loser. Uh, and today I would like to share our story and our this 30, 50, 15 years uh, way how we developed uh, a strategy or how to say just how to get this very good and very nice result and control the process. The very first question was, should we go for immediate or for early implant placement? And I cannot forget one of my classmates. After we finished school, school, and she came to me and said, Elgidas, I know you are a good dentist, so can you help me? I need, uh, I need to restore two teeth. I said, yeah, no problem, let's do it. I will extract it in one day, just put a, uh, also temporous, immediate implantation, and also temporous at one day, and you see the result. So that time, I blamed only immediate implant placement because I was taught by ITI. And 50% 30 case, 30 of cases end up with recession if we choose cases with thin biotype and thin buccal wall. And until 2014, I used only such cases for immediate implantation. Just when thick tissues were present, very thick bone wall was present, so it's a suitable case. But honestly to say, 2014, after ITI consensus paper was published, so of systematic review on timing, I was a little bit confused because it was concluded that aesthetics may be achieved with immediate implant placement, but with the same time, Recession is a risk for immediate implant placement. Then I looked a little bit more in detail to this paper. And you know what I found? That first of all, insufficient randomized clinical trials were added to the systematic review. It's a one thing. And another one, that they were all very significant, very heterogeneous. So they, are, they were very different. What does it mean? It means that Initial situations were different, with thick bone or thin bone, uh, tissue biotype was different, uh, biomaterials uh, what, what used, uh, if any used, and soft tissues were augmented or not. 
So it was absolutely different papers. They just put it in one pot. And really, we cannot take these conclusions to a daily clinical practice. Because systematic review of such few papers, it's just like a direction that we have some data on it or not. And also, some of my colleagues who used other brand implants said, oh, I'll get this, you are old fashioned, you drive old Mercedes by doing implants only early approach and not going by immediate. So when Thomas came to me and said, you know, I'll get this, you doubt so much about what time to use and what, when to place an implant, and let's make a randomized clinical trial and just answer for ourselves at least what should we do? And we designed a study, so we have 25 patients in one group and 25 in another one. And this data is still not published, it will be next year. And we have all the statistics. Crestal bone is absolutely the same stability. It's absolutely no difference between immediate implant placement and early implant placement. And aesthetic result is even better with immediate cases. So, and when we compare invasiveness for patient, there's, I think, no, no any questions, no more any questions what to choose. And when we say this is difficult and this is easier, I say early implant placement. No, absolutely not. So, and it was also data what I could found, find that in comparison who compared immediate implant placement with early and grafted soft tissues together. So they found also the same or even better aesthetic result in the end of the day with immediate implant placement. So, starting 2014, our approach for immediate implant, for aesthetic rehabilitation in the aesthetic area for single tooth, uh, it's mainly immediate implant placement. Just by knowing this, that Time is uh, not the most important factor for, for recession, so we have to think how to achieve this stable result, how to develop this stable result from a prosthetic point of view. And what we started to do, we just started to analyze successful cases. Of course, we have to learn from mistakes, it's, a, it's a for sure. But in the same time, we have to know where to go and how this successful case looks like, what we should to create and what we should to have to maintain this uh, result stable. So, first of all, we have to have implant and bone around implant. And, of course, fix soft tissues. And after, very beautiful restoration. That's it. Just four consistent things. And here I would like to concentrate a little bit more to soft tissues. Yeah. Everybody agrees that bone, two millimeter round implant uh, neck, it's enough and it's already a good result. But what does it mean, thick tissues? As we're saying, well, we, we have to have a thick tissues. And here, 10 years or, and 17 publications on uh, vertical soft tissue thickness influence on crestal bone stability shows that we have to have at least three millimeter of vertical soft tissue thickness to maintain crystal bone stable. Otherwise, crystal bone will resorb because of the establishment of biological width, and in aesthetic area, it may lead to recession. So, it's already clear, evidence-based, that four millimeter we have to have for vertical soft tissue thickness, and vertical soft tissue thickness maintains the bone. But then, if I place implant a little bit more buccally, I reduce soft tissues horizontally. So how much I can reduce tissues horizontally, but still have the same vertical height? And when we draw this contour, you can clearly see that if we reduce horizontal soft tissue thickness, so the gingiva will go up. And if gingiva go up, so we have a less vertical height, so we lose bone. So we can conclude that horizontal soft tissue thickness maintains vertical thickness, and vertical maintains the bone. One more time, 
Papillas are hold on bone or neighbor teeth. And buccal soft tissue depends on horizontal soft tissue. Because horizontal holds vertical, vertical leads to stable crystal bow. Four millimeter rule. So what is exactly what we see after immediate implant placement if we follow this rule? And this is what zero bonus concept all about. To get this four millimeter for buccal thickness, we have to place implant in, in the correct 3D position, what Eric already mentioned here. And I remember also the day when I was in conference and my assistant sent me uh, a picture and saying, you know, I'll just look, we augmented soft tissue, we, do bone, we did bone augmentation, and a prostodontist destroyed our work. Look, what, what is the result? And I thought, you know, perhaps it's me because of bad angulation. And despite I knew this already 15 or 20 years where to place implant and how the correct position should be, but the problem is that me, as a typical man, I cannot concentrate on two things. If I look for angulation, I lose primary stability. If I look for primary stability, then I lose angulation. So it means if I drill too much, so I can lose primary stability, but if I just drill with less drill, so I can lose my angulation. And here I found very good suggestion how to do, how to get primary stability, but also be in a correct angulation. So first of all, under-prepare the apical part and to prepare till the end palatal, uh, coronal part. Because palatal bone is very hard, and if we under-prepare apical, we can be moved to buccal side. So, and it works basically with all implants, and it used to work with BL, BLT, and uh, now with new BLX, it's even easier, and it's even better. But despite that, we have to prepare palatal side till then, otherwise, we maybe move to buccal side. And can you imagine that only by 10 degrees moving implant, we will reduce the tissues in a half of thickness. So exactly what had happened for me in this case. So just always remember, we have to have this four millimeter at least for buccal soft tissue thickness. Also, suggestion was to use, in the literature we can find a lot of papers to use a small diameter implants. And uh, some papers are saying that rock solid alloy is a one of the biocompatibles, the most biocompatible, and also the strongest one. And by me personally, I feel very comfortable by using 3.3 or 3.5 or 3.75 implant now in aesthetic area. And here I would like to share one uh, interesting case. Just tooth, lateral incisor tooth, uh, was placed 11 years ago, and it is 3.8 millimeter in diameter. And central incisor was placed recently, new BLX 3.75. It's the same, almost the same diameter. But as you can see, the platform is smaller on BLX. And we have, again, one millimeter more for soft tissue thickening. So, and this will lead, again, to more stability of soft tissue. So we have a more stable soft tissues. After we placed implants in correct 3D position, after we used small diameter implant, we have a gap, and we think about augmentation. Bone, or bone and soft tissue. And here we also realized, during all these years, that there are many classifications, and the patients who come for treatment, uh, they are different. So some of them, they have thick gingiva and thick bone. In that situation, we place implant, we do temporary crown, Crown should be as small as possible and just start to widen on the gingival area, just very concave for more space for soft tissue grafting. But in cases when we have very thick tissues and very thick bone, we do nothing. 
we just leave like it, like it is. Just the problem is that I don't have such cases. One in, in, in 10 years, maybe. Usually it's thick gingiva and thin bone, for example. Then it's a mandatory to augment the bone. It's no need to augment for augmentation for soft tissue augmentation. And when we take uh, some bone graft, first of all, I used xenograft. When I switch to uh, allografts, it works perfect. But allograft cannot maintain uh, the volume over the time that we see in our practice. So I came back to xenograft. And I've used uh, BIOS for many years. And 2017, Straumann convinced me to try a new Straumann xenograft. And honestly, to say it works perfectly, I don't see any, any difference. One more thing. I was also very doubt about surface, because SLA surface showed beautiful results. So it was no need for me to improve anything. It was maybe 1% of failures, early failures with SLA. But one paper convinced me. It was published by Frank Schwartz. It's in a doc model. We augmented bone around SLA and SLA active surface. And after eight weeks, on SLA active surface, we found 80% of surface covered by bone, by new bone. And on SLA, act, uh, on SLA surface, only 5%. So really, this paper convinced me, at least with bone augmentation, always to use SLA active implants. And finally, when we have thin gingiva and thin bone, what is perhaps the most of the cases, at least in our country, in Lithuania, so when it's a mandatory to augment soft tissues. And graft from palate is a golden standard, of course. And it shows a beautiful results. After we place implant, fill the gap with a bone material, then, at least by myself, I was taught just to make split thickness flat and to place a graft in between periostum and gingiva and secure it with one or two sutures. The grafts became smaller and smaller over the time, because in the beginning we started with a huge grafts with tunneling, and now we place in just one small piece. And one more thing, after we do this surgery, so we're waiting for beautiful healing, for beautiful emerging profile and texture and color. But if we elevate a split thickness flap, the graft from palate tends to grow. And over the time, we see differentiation. It looks Ugly. So when we looked a little bit back to our studies, when we augmented soft tissues vertically and we placed crafts direct on denuded bone, we elevated full thickness flat. And also the same I found in the literature for and with uh, recession coverage. When we cover recession, somehow we elevate full thickness flap and keratinized tissue area and place a graft on denuded bone. So that's why it couldn't work in, in, uh, in an aesthetic area. So since that, we started to elevate full thickness flap and starting to split only in mucogingival area and position it. And during all these studies, what we done, have done now, we see beautiful healing and no differentiation. Sometimes it grows a little bit, but no differentiation. It looks all the time beautiful, texture, color, etc. And of course, one more question. No one patient was happy with graft, grafting from when we take graft from palate. We're always saying, okay, it's okay when you do implant placement and, uh, and, and, and some bone grafting, but what you did with my palate, I, I never forget it. So I was curious, maybe we can use some other materials, for example, like uh, mucoderm from company Bottis. Uh, and uh, we, I have been using it since 2010, perhaps, or 10 years, I've done more than 1,000 operations. And on recently, we just came to the idea to make a histological study, 20, 20 cases. We augmented tissues vertically, and we got 1.8 millimeter on average soft tissue thickening in, in vertical dimension. So, and uh, the histology showed also perfect results. No reaction as a foreign body, no inflammatory cells, good blood supply and nutrition, so it was everything very nice. Of course, now the question is, it's not evidence-based to use it in aesthetic area, so that's to also randomize clinical trials. So was that, again, our idea, and we designed to study. It's not finished yet. I don't have any statistics, but I can share just pilot studies. 
If we need to thicken soft tissues, this material could be also suitable for such thing. Only one difference between mucoderm and connective tissue graft is mucoderm cannot keratinize. It's no keratinized wear. But in aesthetic area, usually we have enough of keratinized tissues. We, have, we need just to thicken tissues, so maybe it could help. But we need to wait a little bit for final results and to see, to see a clear statistic on it. So with this, dear colleagues, I would like to conclude and to say a few take-home messages. So first of all, please have in mind that horizontal soft tissue thickness maintains vertical soft tissue thickness, and vertical leads to stable crestal bone. So four millimeter rule, keep the end in mind. To get this, we have to position implant in correct 3D position. So for that, we have to prepare palatal a coronal palatal bone till the end. Otherwise, we can be moved to buccal side. And with just a little bit, and then you lose this horizontal soft tissue thickness. And also, it's very, very important to make a concave temporary, just for more space for augmentation, and to place implant four millimeter deeper for future margin, or at least 3.5. Because 3.5 is the limit in aesthetic area for biological width, again, to maintain crystal bone stable. And I come back because most of you want to photograph this. Please take a picture. So, and finally, dependent on initial anatomical situation, we have to choose the right grafting method. To do nothing, or to do just bone augmentation, or when we have thin gingiva and thin bone, bone and soft tissue. And only in cases when we have no bone on buccal wall, when we have inflammation, maybe when to refuse from immediate implant placement, or think about other approach, like for example IDR, we hear today very nice presentation, or go for early implant placement. By having new devices, what industry, in this case Straumann, offers us, and following this four millimeter rule, we really are able to develop stable, beautiful results. Just now I would like to invite Thomas to a stage and to share also ideas how to maintain this result, what we were able to develop. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Great job.